we're going to end with combating viruses. Um, so what anatomical features might you target in a virus that would not harm a human host? You know, we talked about that with antibacterials, but what about antivirals? So what could you, because the thing is that it's kind of tricky with viruses because they're so simple. There's not, they don't have a lot of anatomical features. So is there anything that's unique to them? So what could you target that's in a virus to kill it? Well, you could target its DNA or RNA, but of course, all cells also have DNA and RNA. So our cells would be damaged. If you, if you gave someone a medicine that destroyed DNA or destroyed RNA, that's going to destroy the human host, right? Target transcription or translation. Let's just shut down transcription translation. Well, that's pretty much going to have the same effect as targeting the DNA or RNA. Uh, the cell's not going to be able to, if you, if you target transcription translation, the cell can't use its DNA to make new materials that it needs, more cell parts. That's going to um, damage the cell as much, you know, of course. So that's all, that's going to damage the cell as much as the virus. Because, of course, the virus, all the virus needs from the cell is replication equipment. It, it, trans, it, it uh, copies its genetic material, transcribes and translates it into new viral proteins. You get more gene, uh, viral genes. You get more viral proteins. They all come together. They assemble, and the virus leaves. If you can prevent it from, if you, if you stop transcription translation, you stop the virus from copying itself. But... Um, cell also needs those processes to stay alive. So that's not going to be so great for saving the human. Um, target the proteins. Now, this is probably the best thing you can do because while we have proteins too, we've talked about how proteins have unique shapes. So it, it might be possible to target a unique shaped protein that's unique to the virus that the human doesn't have. It can get tricky, though, with viruses because they don't have a lot of proteins to choose from. So if the viral protein is too similar in shape to any human protein in the whole human body, that could have negative consequences for the host as well. And we often, you know, antivirals typically do this. They typically target a very specific viral protein, but you often find that antivirals have really horrible side effects and that is why because it's really there's not a lot of proteins to choose from in a virus and the viral proteins are going to be somewhat similar sometimes to some human protein somewhere in the body and then the drug is going to target both of those both the human you know maybe it'll target the virus more than it'll target the host but it might still have some nasty side effects for the host target the lipid envelope. Well, obviously you can't do that. The lipid envelope, you know, that first of all, that it would only affect enveloped viruses. But um, even, you know, let's just say you have an infection, coronavirus is an enveloped virus, right? So you have a, a, a coronavirus infection. Bleach works by, uh, by dissolving the, the plasma membrane of cells, which is the same thing as the lipid envelope. It, it bleach disrupts the phospholipid bilayer, which is what the lipid envelope is, right? Because the lipid envelope came from the previous host cell. Um, but you don't want to drink bleach, right? Because it's going to, again, it's going to harm your cells with their own phospholipid bilayers as much as it's going to harm the virus. So these are all fine and dandy if you're talking about um, killing something on an inanimate object, like a tabletop. But you don't, aside from a very carefully chosen protein target, you're not going to want to take any medicine that dis that destroys any of these because that is going to wreak havoc on your human cells because you share all of this with the viruses. So you can see viruses do not have, they because they're so simple, there's not much to choose from in terms of good antiviral, you know, good anatomical targets to target with an antiviral that will harm the virus but preserve the human host. And then what if the virus is a retrovirus? What if, what if it becomes a provirus embedded in the human DNA? We do not have a method yet for excising that. Now, many of you are probably aware of the fact, of, of, aware of CRISPR. CRISPR is a gene editing um, technology that is fairly new. And this is going to be the technology that leads to designer babies if we're not, you know, if we don't carefully think about what our politics and philosophies and ethics are around gene editing. But the benefit of CRISPR is that you could per potentially do things like take out harmful mutations uh, or, or take out a prophage, a provirus that has become a part of your genetic chromosome, your, your own human chromosome. 
The problem is getting it to every cell. So right now, CRISPR, you can, you can use in the embryo, because the embryo is only a few, not the embryo, I'm sorry, the, before the embryo, the blastocyst. Um, so you have, you have the zygote, you have the blastocyst, these are just a few cells. So if you go into the mother's womb, there's only a few cells to edit, um, and you can do that, but what if? But 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 if you're talking about HIV, a retrovirus like HIV, that inserts its viral DNA into the chromosome of every white blood cell in the body, how are you going to get that gene editing software to each and every white blood cell? You can't take them all out, edit them, and put them back in again. So we don't have a technology for that. Okay, so that's where the, the so we don't have maybe one day in the not so distant future we'll be able to gene edit in a way that allows us to clip out the provirus like HIV or herpes or whatever chickenpox from from our chromosomes our human chromosomes and then mend the chromosome back together where uh, around the cut. But right now we don't um, we don't have the ability to do that in a way that can help us with prophages. Cancer and viruses. So this, there's some interesting relationships between viruses and cancer. So cancer, just to remind you, cancer is when um, uh, uh, your, your own cells, um, the, the, their cell cycle starts to unravel. Like they start to grow and divide. Grow, you know, cells have this cycle where they grow, they divide. They grow, they divide. They grow, they divide. Um, this, when the cell cycle starts to go out of control, cells start to do that really fast and when they're not supposed to. So cell, your cells are supposed to grow and divide when they need to, like if you lose some cells because of a wound or because the cells died or something like that. Um, now then you're supposed to replace your old cells or when you're in the process of growing from a baby to an adult or from a zygote to an infant, you know, to a baby. So if you're, but if your cell cycle is not hearing is not able to receive stop signals like okay you've divided enough it's time to stop now some cells have a mutation where they can't hear that environmental message oh there's enough cells here I can stop now and they just keep going they just keep dividing 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 and they make a, a mass of cells a cluster of cells that gets bigger and bigger and bigger um, and that is what cancer is so cancer is when the cell cycle, including cell division, continues forward without regulation, without stopping, and it creates this over-division of host cells. So you get this large mass. So how do, what does this have to do with viruses? Well, okay, so you have these oncogenes. Um, uh, let's, let's talk about oncogenes. So like I said, cancer is the over-proliferation or uncontrolled growth of certain cells, and it can happen due to a mutation in, in a gene that has to do with cell growth or cell death. So the cells are growing too much or they're not dying fast enough. Um, cells have several mechanisms that help them sense when it is appropriate to divide and also when it is appropriate to die. Uh, the genes responsible for those mechanisms, if those genes become dysfunctional, it's likely to cause cancer. So proto-onco is the term for the genes that are implicated in regulating or controlling the cell cycle and cell division. So you have these proto-oncogenes. The proto-oncogenes are implicated in regulating the cell cycle so that the cells don't move forward. They, can, they stop when they're supposed to stop. They don't move forward too fast. They die when they're supposed to die. So the genes in control of the cell cycle the healthy genes are called, are called proto-oncogenes. So up here, these are the genes implicated in regulating the cell cycle. They could become mutated, so they are not functioning properly. And when they're mutated, they're called oncogenes. So oncogenes were proto-oncogenes that now don't work. And when you have an oncogene, that's a cancer-causing gene. It's a, cancer, it's, a, it's a cancerous version of a proto-oncogene. So the proto-oncogene is the normal working version of the gene that makes sure cells are not over-dividing to prevent you from getting cancer. If they mutate in a way that makes them dysfunctional, they become oncogenes, which are cancer-causing. Right. Now, there's this thing called oncogenic viruses. An oncogenic virus is a virus that can increase the risk of cancer. These are usually retroviruses. Um, because what retroviruses do, as you know, is they insert themselves into the chromosome. Well, what if they insert themselves into the middle of a proto-oncogene? So you have this proto-oncogene that's working just right, it's doing its job, it's keeping your cells from dividing too fast, it's making sure that you have just the right number of cells, not too many, not too few, and then this retrovirus comes along and it just 
pushes itself into the middle, just blasts apart this proto-oncogene and inserts itself right in the middle of it. Now that gene is dysfunctional, okay? So, that dis so if a retrovirus inserts itself into a proto-oncogene that disrupts the proto-oncogene and converts it into an oncogene, which then results it can result in cancer, or at least an in increased risk in cancer. The reason you don't always get cancer when you have a retrovirus is two reasons. One is, who knows where the virus is going to insert itself. Maybe it inserts itself somewhere else that's not an oncogene, and then it doesn't cause cancer. But the other thing is that you have lots of oncogenes, and so you actually have to have more than one mutation, because if one oncogene is disrupted, you still have other checks and balances. You still have other oncogenes that, um, that can control cell division. But what, um, what a retrovirus, what, what an oncogenic virus can do is it increases the risk of cancer. Because if you already have one or two mutations to other proto-oncogenes, so you already have a couple oncogenes now, cancer-causing oncogenes, and they add one more, that might, be, that might push you over the edge uh, into getting cancer. Uh, so an example would be um, HPV, right, human papillomavirus. HPV is associated with cervical cancer, and this is why. So it's, it, it is a retrovirus, uh, and it can disrupt oncogene, uh, proto-oncogenes, converting them to oncogenes, but not, you know, like... A, most people have HPV. It's the most common STD. Um, and so it's not like every woman who has HPV gets cervical cancer, right? Most of us don't. It's just increasing the risk. So if one of your cells in your cervix already experienced some mutation to a proto-oncogene uh, or a couple mutations to a proto-oncogene or maybe you inherited a mutation to a proto-oncogene from your parent, that retrovirus might push you over the edge into cancer. So it's, it, it just, almost all cervical cancer is due to the oncogenic virus HPV, but not all HPV causes cancer, right? So if you have cervical cancer, it's 99% likely that you have HPV and that's what caused it. But most people with HPV don't get cervical cancer, if that makes sense. It, it just increases your risk. It's not that it's a definitive, you know, you, get, you are now going to have it. You just want to, you know take precautions to monitor, that's all. So, um, all right, so, oh, so so we talked about how oncogenic viruses can disrupt proto-oncogenes by inserting themselves into the middle of them and thus obliterating their function. Um, alternatively, some viruses can contain oncogenes within them and then insert those oncogenes into the host chromosome. So maybe the virus has genes that causes over-proliferation of cells, and now they put those genes for over-proliferation into the human cell. Right? Um, so those are going to be genes that increase the rate of cell division. So those are the two ways. They can disrupt a working proto-oncogene, converting it into an oncogene, or they can bring oncogene, cancerous oncogenes with them and insert them into the host cell's chromosome. Now, it's really hard to tell if a virus causes a cancer because it can be latent for a long time as a provirus. So we talked in the previous lectures about how a provirus can be latent or expressed, right? And when it's lying latent, it's just sitting there doing nothing in the host cell's chromosome. It's just getting rep passively being replicated by the host cell. Every time the host cell divides to make offspring, the provirus is passed to its offspring. So it gets replicated passively and it's not really doing anything. It's not transcribing and translating viral proteins. It's not making more virions that are then leaving the cell and killing the cell. So, so it's hard to tell if a virus causes cancer because it can be latent for a long time as a provirus, so you can have the virus long before you ever see any cancer. Uh, and maybe one day it'll start expressing itself and start creating cancer, but you might not see that for a long, long time. And also because even though viruses are infectious, cancer itself is not infectious. So even viruses that can cause cancer are not always clearly implicated because you can pass the virus from one person to another and that shows, uh, and, and then you can clearly see, oh, the virus causes this, these set of symptoms or whatever. But then if someone develops cancer from it, they're not passing their cancer with the virus, right? The cancer is just uh, contained within one human and not passed to the next human. And so it, the cancer doesn't move directly with the virus. And so again, that's another reason why it's hard to link up which viruses cause which kinds of cancers. But it is thought that there could be a lot of cancers um, that 
are uh, that are actually caused by a virus. So 10% of cancers have been linked to viral infections, and there might be many more that we just haven't drawn the connection uh, yet. All right. So now on the converse side of that, there's something, so those were oncogenic virus. Genic refers to genesis. So if you think about genesis in the Bible, that's like the creation of all things. Um, so genesis is creation. And oncogenes refer to genes that cause cancer. So oncogenic viruses are viruses that create cancer. An oncolytic virus is a virus that lyses or destroys cancer cells. So you have oncogenic viruses that start cancer and you have oncolytic viruses that kill cancer that destroy cancer cells. All right, so in the 1900s, it was observed that tumors regressed in patients with viral infections. Some, you know, there were certain viral infections that uh, caused tumors to regress. Um, and it, what people noticed then is that there are some viruses that selectively infect cancer cells. They target cancer cells. And as we learned about, you know, we learned about animal viruses and how they enter and exit a cell. So they tend to lyse the cell, the host cell, upon release. So these viruses are infecting the cancer cell, replicating, and then they burst out of the cancer cell, killing the cancer cell because they lyse it open. So now there's all this research because, you know, chemotherapy for tumors is, it's, it's kind of like bloodletting. It's so clumsy. So people used to bloodlet where they would say, okay, if you have a disease and you're dying from a disease, the disease is in the humors. They, they had you know, some intuition where this disease is in the humors or the fluids of the body. So they would let out a patient's blood to try to get rid of the disease. Um, and hopefully the patient, uh, hopefully the disease was gotten rid of before the patient died. Well, it didn't work too often, right? That's not actually the best way to cure disease. So, uh, but, but chemotherapy is a little bit like that because when you take chemotherapy, chemotherapy is a chemical therapy. It's chemical poison for tumor cells. But tumor cells are your cells. It's your own cells that have a mutation and so they're replicating too quickly. So what chemotherapy, what chemotherapies do is they stop cell division in the whole body. The whole body, so whether you're getting radiation or you're taking a drug in your body that diffuses through your body, what both of those things do is they stop cell division. But your body, so you're stopping the tumor from making new cells, but you're also stopping the rest of your body from making new cells, which means cause wreaks all kinds of havoc on your body. Your hair follicles, um, they're, they're, they need to be, the cells in your hair follicles need to be replaced rapidly. And if your cells aren't dividing to make new cells, that's why your hair falls out, because the hair follicles die and they're not being replaced. Uh, so a lot of chemotherapy patients lose their hair. Uh, you don't make white blood cells or red blood cells enough, because again, these are cells that get replaced constantly in the bloodstream. Um, and if you're not, you're not having any cell division, you can't make new ones. So uh, you, can't, you can't heal very well, because healing requires cell division, replacement of new cell, old cells with new ones. So chemotherapy is sort of the same thing as bloodletting in that you're trying to kill the tumor before you kill the patient. But the therapy, the chemotherapy and the radiation is actually killing all the human cells at the same time. You're just hoping the tumor will be held back um, enough to extend the human's life. But it's very clumsy. So what if you could take a virus and target cancer cells? Instead of killing all the cells in the body, instead of stopping all the cells from dividing, what if we could find a way to target the tumor? Or even if the tumor is metastasized and it's spread through the host's body, what if you could find a way to target the tumor cells and leave the other normal cells alone? Well, that's the idea with oncolytic viruses. What if we genetically, so that's this last point here, genetically modified viruses. We could remove virulence from them so they could infect tumors harmlessly. And then we could add genes that promote white blood cells, right? So. Uh, so that's so. So now there's a lot of research into genetically modifying viruses that are already kind of oncolytic. They already ha tend to target tumor cells, make them more targeted, and uh, add genes that promote white blood cell. So, and then you could add these extra features. So not only are they targeting tumor cells, but they're not virulent, so they can infect tumors harmlessly to the rest of the body. And they can you can add genes that promote white blood cells so that the patient is getting a higher white blood cell count to also help in the battle against cancer.